Can't you just feel it? The conflict is becoming apparent in our culture. It reminds me of those words of John Paul II. We're now living in the final confrontation between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between the church and the anti-church, between Christ and the antichrist. And if we don't choose to know God's word, to believe God's word, and follow God's word, we're gonna be a sitting duck for all kinds of confusion, all kinds of disorder. Those are really important choices that people have to make. And these choices are difficult. Who am I gonna marry? What kind of life am I gonna live? How am I gonna raise my kids? What am I gonna do with my time, my talent, and my treasure? And I have to make a choice today. Jesus says to each one of us, I came that you might have life and have it to the full. The question is, do we want it? Welcome to another week of the choices we face. And uh, we are facing choices all the time. And we just really hope that our program today can help you make a choice against discouragement, against oppression, for hope. Peter, you know, one of the wonderful things that the Lord lets us do each year is this Lift Jesus Higher rally in Toronto, yeah. which is one of the most inspiring things. I mean, it's just sort of like, it's all the nations of the world are there and, uh, and the people are so hungry. You know, so many of them say, we're just not getting what we need to be able to handle the confusion in our culture right now. We're just not getting what we need to, to know how to look at things or what to do type of thing. And so they just come away from the rally, strengthened and given hope. And uh, it's just a wonderful opportunity. Yeah, it is life giving. And I think when uh, it's always reminds me of how powerful God's word is. You proclaim the word and you lift Jesus. The Holy Spirit helps people whose hearts are hungry to be able to see in G to see Jesus, really. Yes. To see him in his heart, which gives birth to hope. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not alone. He's with me. I can see where my future's going. You know what I mean? It just yeah. changes perspective. Yeah. And uh, you, people can come in with like a heavy blanket on them of discouragement and worry and fear, and they just leave. It's like, you could just see it on their face, how, how it happens over across the day. They kind of get transformed. Yeah. And then you have that, the joy starts to emerge yeah. because hope is being birthed. So it's right. really beautiful. And let's hope that that happens today yes. for those who are going to participate in the Toronto Rally uh, through TV and radio. Now, our theme this year, I think, is so relevant. Jesus is the light of the world. And we've already heard phrases from the scriptures about the light came into the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. So I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about the darkness. We're not going to dwell on it, but we really need to be realistic about the darkness that we're facing so we can better discern what's light and what's dark, so we can better discern what's true and what's false, and so we can better appreciate the absolutely astounding, amazing gift of God, of the light that's come into the darkness and the light that's still shining and the light that we can know and love and embrace more fully today. You've heard me talk about this before, but I think it's still so relevant. The prophetic words of St. John Paul II shortly before he got elected Pope. And those of you who are there for the first time, many of you perhaps have never heard this. Here's what he said. He said, we are now standing in the face of the greatest historical confrontation humanity has ever experienced. I do not think that the wide circle of the American society or of the wider circle of Christian communities realizes this fully. We're now facing the final confrontation between the church and the anti-church, between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between Christ and the anti-Christ. This confrontation, though, lies within the plans of divine providence. God has permitted darkness to fall on the world because he's got a plan for overturning that darkness and rescuing his people to the glory of God and the salvation of souls. He's permitted evil. He's permitted the rebellion of the angels. He's permitted the fall of the first human beings. 
He's permitted the darkness that we're now experiencing because he's got a plan. The darkness is not out of his control. He's permitting it only for the purpose of bringing good. But it's going to be a challenging good. It's going to be a very challenging thing to understand God's word. But we're going to talk about it today. Now, when John Paul II wrote about this confrontation, he referred us to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where it, scripture talks about the final confrontation. Now, I'm going to be sharing with you some scripture today. I want to remind you of the, how the Catholic Church tells us we need to take sacred scripture because it is sacred scripture. Vatican II in the Constitution on Sacred Revelation said this, section 11, everything asserted by the sacred authors should be considered to be asserted by the Holy Spirit and to teach firmly, faithfully, and without error those truths which God wished to consign to the sacred writings for the sake of our salvation. This is not just good ideas we're going to be hearing about. This is the word of God. In fact, St. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, We thank God constantly for this, that when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. There's human words, and then there's human words that are inspired by the Holy Spirit that are the word of God. And this word works in us, and today, as we speak God's word, expect this word to work in you. Expect it to get down into the depths of your soul. Expect it to illumine your mind. Expect it to show you any darkness in your life that the light of Jesus needs to shine on. This is a powerful word. This is a true word. So, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let no one deceive you in any way. There are so many warnings against deception in the sacred scriptures. Jesus warns about false teachers and false prophets. The apostles warn about wolves that are going to come into the flock and try to take them away. Paul says, don't listen to this particular teacher because he'll make your faith a shipwreck. We just discovered a book being sold back here today that hopefully won't be sold anymore that says Jesus didn't really found the church. There's a lot of junk still going on in the church. There's a lot of false teaching and false prophecy. There's a lot of deception. And the only way that we can be protected against deception is to know the word of God, is to know what God's word actually says, and also to know the word of God who is Jesus. Jesus says, my own will recognize my voice. And as we deepen our relationship with the Lord, as we grow in prayer, as we grow in holiness, when somebody says something that doesn't sound quite right, we're going to recognize it as not sounding quite right because we're going to have become accustomed to the Lord's words himself, both in Scripture and also how we've become accustomed to who he is in prayer. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says, Don't let anybody deceive you. The Lord has not already returned. You didn't miss it. That's good to know, isn't it? We haven't been left behind. <laughs> and Paul says, the reason why you shouldn't be confused about this is because I've told you that two things need to happen before the Lord returns. One of them is what Paul calls the mass apostasy. What's a mass apostasy? Apostasy isn't something that pagans do. It's something that Christians do. And what it is, is the repudiation of faith on the part of those who once had it, the turning away from Christ as the light of the world by those who once knew him and believed in him. 
I don't know whether what we're experiencing right now is the a mass apostasy or not, but I do know that we're experiencing a mass apostasy. Catholic nation after Catholic nation that used to honor the Lord, that used to believe in the Ten Commandments, that used to have social pressure for honoring God, have turned away from the Lord in truly massive ways. You know, one of the saddest things in the last couple of years was seeing after Ireland, the Catholic nation of Ireland, which for 800 years under persecution heroically kept the faith and sent missionaries to the four corners of the world, that after 30 years of prosperity, sold their precious gift of faith for a mess of European market porridge. And after they legalized abortion, tens of thousands of young Irish people flooded into the streets of Dublin celebrating that they now could kill babies like the rest of Europe. How dark the darkness. How tragic the apostasy. There used to be three nations in Europe that were strongly resisting the darkness that's flooding over the world. One was Ireland. Ireland has now gone over to the other side as a nation. The other two nations that were resisting were Poland and Malta. Poland is still resisting. God bless the Poles. <laughs> Poland is still clear about what the faith is. The Polish bishops are still strong in defending it and teaching it. The third nation was Malta, 90% Catholic. About seven years ago, they legalized divorce. I was just there doing a retreat for priests last, last year. I was talking to the auxiliary bishop, and he said, ever since they legalized divorce, it's like it's opened the floodgates. The whole thing is collapsing. All the other pressure groups are coming in now. Before you know it, we're going to have abortion. We already have strong gay lobbies going on in the country. Uh, the government no longer even consults the Catholic Church anymore, even though it's a 90% quote Catholic country, they're consulting these pressure groups that are pushing for more and more and more abandonment of faith and morality. Malta is going. We already know what's happening in the other European countries. We know what's happening in Canada and to a certain extent in the United States. We we know the hostility towards Christ and the church that's growing. We know the political power that intends to crush the opposition. You know, people used to say, all we want is tolerance for diversity of views. They don't want tolerance for diversity of views anymore. They want to eliminate certain views. They want to crush people who oppose the juggernaut of secularism that's going on. So we're in a battle. The second thing that Paul says that needs to happen before the Lord returns is the removal of a restrainer that the Lord has placed on evil. And then Paul says at a certain point, that restraint on evil will be removed and then there'll be unrestrained lawlessness and rebellion and the man of rebellion will appear. What we've seen of course over the last number of years is little by little, restraints on evil being systematically removed. And there are people dedicated to removing every single restraint on immorality, every single restraint on rebellion against God. It's getting to the point where a famous gay advocate who thought it was really good the progress that we made in the culture accepting homosexuality, wrote a book called The Madness of Crowds. And he says, we're going over a cliff and we don't even realize it. We're doing experiments on young people who want to change their gender identity. We have no idea what the long-term results are going to be. We're, we're being pulled on by the madness of crowds. You know, people are saying, you better get on the right side of history. Well, what they call the right side of history is going over a cliff to the destruction of human life. It's going to hell. I don't know whether these two signs are being fulfilled in our time or not, but I do know that for the first time since 
the Emperor Constantine became a Christian in the early fourth century, we're seeing a repudiation of the way in which the Western nations base themselves on Judeo-Christian principles and belief and culture. We're seeing something really significant. We're seeing the difference between light and darkness getting clearer and clearer. We're seeing the conflict that's under the surface coming out into the open. We're seeing it not only affecting the world, but we're seeing it affecting the church. Paul doesn't just warn us about not being deceived. He doesn't just equip us by knowing that certain things need to happen before the Lord returns, but he tells us what's going to happen when the man of lawlessness, the man of rebellion, perhaps the Antichrist is revealed. The Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth. Just when it seems like evil has reached a point where it's impossible to resist, it's engulfing the whole world, the Lord Jesus will appear and will slay him with the breath of his mouth. Just when all hope seems to be lost, Jesus will return in glory to judge the living and the dead, to gather his faithful ones to himself, and to separate from the kingdom forever those who have persisted in unbelief and immorality. So listen to what Paul says. The coming of the lawless one will be with pretended signs and wonders, things that don't really lead people to conversion, things that really aren't acts of God, but are acts of magic or sorcery or illusion. And with every wicked deception destined for those on their path to perish. Who is destined to perish? God wills the whole human race to be saved. He doesn't want anybody to be lost. But who's going to perish? Those who refuse to open their hearts to the truth and therefore be saved. That's why sharing the word of God is so important. In order for people to be saved, they need to open their hearts to the truth and place their faith and trust in the great light that God has given to the human race to rescue us from the darkness, Jesus, the light of the world. And then it says those who close their hearts to the truth, those who don't love the truth, are going to come under even a stronger deception so they believe even more wholeheartedly what's false and they will be condemned because they did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in immorality. Our culture is spending billions and billions of dollars to get more and more of us to believe what is false, to reject the truth, and to take pleasure in immorality. We're in a battle, and it isn't just against flesh and blood, it isn't just against the pornography industry, it just isn't against radical leftist politics, it's against powers and principalities. It's hard to explain such a rapid collapse of Catholic countries apart from infernal supernatural powers. Powers and principalities are manipulating human operators to lead people to destruction. And then what we have also is contemporary prophetic warnings from people like Lucia, the child of Fatima who lived into her 90s. You know, Mary said, you're going to have to stay here a little while longer. Francisco and Jacinta I'm going to take soon. You know, 87 years longer was a long time to, be able to stay. But she needed to be a witness. And before she died, she wrote a letter to a good cardinal in Rome in charge of marriage and the family. And she said, the final battle between the Lord and the reign of Satan will be about marriage and the family. That's it, isn't it? Trying to destroy male and female, trying to destroy the very image of God in the human race. You know what that's rooted in? Hatred of God, hatred of his creation, hatred of his planet, hatred of us. We're fools to think that Satan, who sometimes disguises himself as an angel of light, has our best interest at heart? No. The alluring satanic lies that promise us happiness, that promise us autonomy, 
It's the same lie that we read about in Genesis. You will be like gods. No, you won't die. You'll be like gods. What a horrible lie. You know, the reason why everybody dies is because they believe that lie. And we've inherited that. But the really amazing thing is that Jesus, the light of the world, by his death and by his resurrection, has made it possible for us to condemn the human beings, for us suffering human beings, for us dying human beings, to not really die, but have death now be a passageway to the glory of the resurrection. We have nothing more precious that could ever be offered to any human being than to have death overcome, to have sin forgiven, to have our souls healed, to have the devil's hold in us broken, and to be transferred from the kingdom of darkness, as scripture says, to the kingdom of his beloved son. Who in their right mind would ever choose to remain in the kingdom of darkness. Only those who have refused to open their hearts to the truth to be saved. Only those who have opened themselves up to satanic deception. So we've got a battle going on. If we love our children, if we love our friends and relatives, if we love our fellow parishioners, we're not just gonna be concerned about them getting good jobs, right? Or getting good chemotherapy for their cancer. We're gonna be concerned about the cancer of sin. We're gonna be concerned about the cancer of rebellion against God. We're gonna be concerned about the real solution to death and disease and dying. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And those who believe in me, even though they die, will not die. And what Jesus was talking about, of course, was the second death. The first death is the biological death. For some, it's the introduction to a second and worse death, the death of eternal separation from God in hell. For others, biological death is a passageway to everlasting life. Well, Peter, it took us a while to get to the hope part, but <laughs> yeah. when we got there, we really got there. Yeah. Because Jesus is the light of the world. He's the hope of the world. Yeah, and, and the conviction about the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is is a, you know, faith, hope, love. These are gifts we're given, theological virtues the Lord gives to us, a capacity to see and to grasp and to live in these things. And friends, it's very, very important for us to understand the Lord has given us the presence, power, and gift of the Holy Spirit, right? Paul says to us, remember, test your faith. He said, test it. Do you know that you're a temple of the Holy Spirit? So God is dwelling in you. So that resurrection reality that Jesus lives, he's the beginning of the new creation. He's passed from death to life. He's at the right hand of God in glory. And the whole new thing has begun. And it's also begun in you. It's a down payment. It's the source of the hope, right? So that hope is a confident expectation that what we see in Jesus the resurrection is going to happen to us if we stay in him. And so it's a deep abiding conviction. It's not just a up and down feeling or emotion that the Holy Spirit wants to give us. I was just thinking of how much the apostles spoke about hope. They lived in hope. They led their people in hope. First Peter, uh, first chapter, I'd encourage you to go to first Peter chapter one today and read it and let it encourage you and build you up. But just a taste of it here in verse three. Peter said, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and to an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer trials so that the genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, which though perishable is now tested by fire, may redound to the praise and the glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus. That's a mouthful, but it's loaded with good stuff. It goes on to say, without having seen him, you love him. And you're filled with unutterable and exalted joy. So Peter's saying, what he's seeing this young church persecuted, marginalized. He's seeing the work of the Holy Spirit in them that transforms them. And the root of it is a confidence 
that they're sharing in through the gift of the Holy Spirit, through baptism, they're sharing in the resurrection of Jesus already in some way. It's touching our lives now, the power that raised Jesus from the dead. And these people were, in, he said, he's a realist. I love this about the apostles. They're realists. He said, even though now you're suffering various trials, and that's the kind of thing where the enemy wants to use to steal our hope. Like what, you know, the discouragement about life, the discouragement about the church, the discouragement about my sickness and my bank account. All those circumstances can steal, if we're not careful, the truth that we stand on. And so Peter confirms so clearly what the power of, what the power of hope looks like. A Christian community surrounded by hostile forces, pressing in against them, even persecuting them. And Peter's just, as a shepherd, he's just smiling and seeing, he said, even though you're suffering these trials, you're filled with unutterable and exalted joy. It's joy that comes from knowing that truth. Rob, I think joy is a sign for us about whether we're connecting with that gift of hope that we're right. given by the Spirit or not. Yeah, I think you're right, so Peter. if we're kind of living in discouragement all the time and beaten down, there's a good sign that God has more for you. Go after it in the Holy Spirit. He wants to help you. Yeah. And even if you're in a, quote, hopeless situation, you're not. Hey, the situation may not improve, but you're going to be with the Lord forever. You know, you're going to be with the Lord forever. So the, you've got the biggest hope and the most important hope that anybody could ever have. You've got hope in resurrection of the dead and life forever in the love of God and love of each other. Fear God and give him glory. Now, Peter didn't make up that phrase. That, that's a phrase that an angel spoke to the whole human race. And Peter wants to speak that to you too. Fear God and give him glory because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And we just absolutely have to be in right relationship with the Lord to give him glory and to be in a place where we can receive the wisdom we need for our salvation and for practically navigating life in this world. So we'd like to give it to you just as a gift. Uh, call the 800 number or go to our website, renewalministries.net, and we'll send it right off to you. We're going to give a little bit more information about how to do that in just a second. But I can't wait to see you again next week. Every single week, we've got choices to make, choices that we face, and we hope to help you make them through this program. One of the most overlooked yet foundational spiritual gifts is the fear of the Lord. The scriptures call this gift a fountain of life, a source of confidence and the beginning of wisdom. Today our culture, politics, and even the church are in crisis. Everyone can see the deep division, the escalation of anger and violence, and whole nations seem to be in the grip of fear. We have come to fear the wrong things, the opinions of men, and losing our idols. The fear of God is not in the land, and God in his mercy is shaking the nations to wake us up so we hear his word. Do not fear what this people fear. Rather, fear God and give him glory. In this booklet, I explain the fear of the Lord, why it is an antidote to the current crisis, and how you can awaken this gift in your life. To receive a free copy, visit our website or call the number on the screen.